Hi, Anthony, and welcome to Exploring the BioEdge viewers, listeners. In this podcast, we'll discuss the remarkable video of a male tiger fending off a tigress. And I don't have much uh, first-hand experience, if any, with with tigers. So I'm out of my depth here, Anthony. Please fill me in on uh, the, the tiger ecology. Uh, I'm used to lions and leopards in the Kruger Park, but uh, it's, it's wonderful new territory to watch these tigers interact. I'd, I was surprised at the difference in size, uh, for one, and then also how the how aggressive the male was towards the, the female. And um, I wondered whether this sort of interaction is likely to be a, a common one and whether it sometimes ends up with, with injury or, or is that just almost a, a, a mock fight? Look forward to your views on it. Yes, well, this is a gem of a clip for all kinds of reasons. It was taken in Ranthambore National Park, which is a tiny little national park in India. Um, the main claim to fame of which is that it has a decent population of the tiger, the Bengal tiger. And um, what's beautiful about this uh, this video is that it's right out in the open on a road. It's beautifully filmed. It presents uh, wonderful views of the animals close up, and it shows an interesting it shows interesting uh, predator-prey interactions as well as social interactions or sexual interactions in the tiger. And so here are some of the highlights. Um, firstly, we see uh, the male, the adult male of the Bengal tiger killing a um, an adolescent male of the sambar deer, Rusa unicola unicola, by strangling it at the throat, which is very interesting. Um, and then for some reason, leaving it on the road and retiring maybe into the shade a little way off before starting to eat. The fact that the, the male tiger doesn't eat immediately is perhaps because it was not particularly hungry at the time and killed the sambar deer more out of um, opportunism than out of, out of hunger. Either way, um, the video picks up with a different individual of the tiger, uh, certainly female and possibly adult, maybe adolescent, but possibly adult. Um, which looks obviously apprehensive and nervous, knowing that it has not killed this prey and therefore eating it will be an act of stealing. There's an obviously, I wouldn't say it looks guilty, but it certainly looks circumspect. And after a bit of, of you know, hesitation, it starts to eat from the hindquarters of the sambar deer. And it doesn't get very far. It gets a, a, a small belly full when the male returns and uh, indignantly um, puts the female in its place. Now, you have to realize that the tiger, unlike the lion, is not a particularly social cat. In fact, you could say it's somewhat antisocial in the sense that it does not form cooperative hunting groups in the way that the lion does. Essentially, tigers hunt and live alone, although it's not as simple as that because, you know, um, a male's territory overlaps the territories of several females. And so there is social interaction. But apart from the, the breeding uh, period or the, the, um, the breeding sequence, the reproductive, the, the mating sequence, there's basically indifference or antagonism among the different individuals of the tiger. They see each other as competitors rather than part of a group. And so it's not really remarkable that the male tiger um, feels no impulse to share its, his prey with, with the female. Um, there isn't really that, that kind of, of thing going on with most cats. Uh, male cats are not chivalrous. Even in the lion, there's only a limited amount of chivalry. Because as we know, the male lion will often eat prey um, in priority, uh, you know, at the expense of, of the females that have actually killed the prey. So cats don't operate sexuosocially or sociosexually in the way that we do. There's no chivalry among cats, really. And so it's not surprising for the male to be bullying or um, threatening the female. What's interesting is the way it's done. And, and the, the, what's wonderful about this particular video footage is it shows for the first time, I've never seen it so clearly in any video clip or even in any photograph, just how the, um, the Bengal tiger is sexually dimorphic. Because what this reveals is that there is considerable sexual dimorphism in the tiger, but it's not in the ways you expect. It's not in the form of a mane. 
uh, and it's not in the form of coloration. Essentially, the male is a scaled up proportional version of the female, even down to the um, jowl tufts. The Bengal tiger has jowl tufts, which are like a rudimentary male, a mane um, centered on the jaws. And you can see here that the, the proportional size of these jowl tufts is exactly the same in the adult male and in the um, probably adult female. So that's not sexually dimorphic, but the animal is just bigger. Um, I'm not sure whether this male is twice as massive as the female, but it's certainly more than 150% more massive. And so there's no contest really. The male is obviously dominant in terms of body mass as well as attitude. And what's interesting is how the female submits because she's certainly submissive. She doesn't run away, which is interesting. But she's submissive in the sense that she crouches down and puts her ears back in a certain way that presumably in tiger language means submission. But she also defends herself by rearing up on her hind legs and um, I suppose you could call it uh, paw spars or fences with her paws in a way where neither animal, neither the male nor the female actually strike each other with the paws. But they go through the motions much like, you know, um, sparring, like in fencing in humans. There's this tokenistic antagonism done bipedally um, that implies that the female doesn't completely acknowledge that she is inferior in the uh, interaction, but she does desist from trying to eat and she does accept that she is has been caught out and has been put in her place. So it's very interesting. The other interesting yeah. aspect of it is that it shows so clearly that a tiger is not simply a striped animal. You know, if you ask uh, the average uh, primary school kid who's familiar with tigers to draw a tiger and you, you pick a student or a, or a child who's very good at drawing and you show them a bunch of uh, tiger photos and then ask them to draw from memory what a tiger looks like, you'll probably find that most human beings will draw a tiger as being fairly uniformly striped. But nothing like that is the case, because if you look carefully at this tiger, you'll see all sorts of interesting nuances in its striping pattern. For example, the shoulders and the forequarters are much less intensely striped than the hindquarters. The stripes um, uh, kind of um, diverge and join again on the flanks into a sort of a, a pattern that I don't know what to call in English, but it's a sort of a, um, a spread and split stripe. And then the other interesting thing is that the tail of the tiger is very interesting compared to the tails of leopards and lions because it's neither tufted nor does it have a white conspicuous um, tip. It's it's a it's a, a, a feeled tail that lacks a caudal flag, and the tail is fairly unexpressive in the tiger, which is quite surprising when you compare it with something like a leopard, which lives in the same environment. So all of these interesting and diverse aspects can be seen in this mm. video. Yeah. Uh, and then the the ears, the back of the ears are just wonderful to watch. Right? Uh, I, I urge viewers just to watch that whole clip, just looking at the ears. Uh, they they almost as expressive as human eyes. Would you agree? It's just quite remarkable. Yes. Well, many felids have interesting patterns on the back of their ears, some more than others. Um, but the tiger is one of the most interesting because it has something that does seem like an eye spot on the back of the ears. And nobody's really ever explained this. Um, there have been cockamamie explanations in terms of the, you know, uh, the, the young following the adult female. But that doesn't work because the male has just as um, impressive ear spots as the female and the juveniles. You know, they're basically born with the ear spot. So that function doesn't really stack up. Um, mm. The other possible explanation is that um, the ears, although they have the pattern on the back, show the pattern from the front because what most feelers do is when they're feeling antagonistic, whether fearful or aggressive, they put the ears back, they turn the ears around, which means that you can see the back of the ear from the front, which displays that black and white pattern. But it's not really understood. I don't know anybody who's really studied it seriously. Uh, those studies are long overdue. It's a problem that applies to all felids, but particularly to the tiger. And uh, at least in this video, we can't explain it, but at least we can watch in detail exactly what the ears do in this particular mm. antagonistic interaction. And viewers, mm. I try to see if there's a difference between the male and the female. I, in, in my limited viewing, I didn't notice a difference, but there may be a difference um, in, in the ear postures between the male that has the psychological upper hand and the female, which has the, you know, the psychologically um, submissive uh, position. Yeah. Uh, and Anthony, I've watched 
a lot of lines over the course of my life, but I, I can't ever recall seeing male and female lions standing up on hind legs and sparring like that. Have you ever encountered that or d does that happen in lions? That's a very good question. And now that you mention it, I suspect it does not happen in, in the lion. Mm. Um, it probably does happen in various other felids. I wouldn't be surprised, for example, if it happens in the caracal and various smaller cats like lynxes. I just don't know. It's a good search image to have. But in, in, in the tiger, it obviously is a as an important. I think if you go to Google Images and you scroll through the thousands of pictures of, of the tiger on the web, you'll probably come up with quite a few where uh, there's an antagonistic um, interaction in the tiger that involves standing up and swatting with the four paws. Yeah. Yeah, I think that perhaps was the most surprising aspect of the video for me is seeing this uh, intense, aggressive interaction between the two. You know, the, a, a male lion and a lioness will squabble next to a kill and you know maybe swat at each other a bit, but but wow, this took it to a new level, didn't it? Um, yes. Uh, well, that's and good, yeah. uh, 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 sorry, a question linked to that is. Given the difference in size, you would think the the female would would scamper away, um, but she holds her ground. And do you think that's because those paws are potentially so dangerous, and the the male tiger just doesn't want to risk being blinded by a by a paw from a paw swat from the female or or do you think it's more some level of polite interaction between male and female, some chivalry, or is it purely the male calculating the risk and, you know, not finishing the female off because it's too dangerous to try that? Well, I think it's a combination of both. I think there's there's a tokenistic chivalry in the sense that, you know, the species survives because there is some degree of solidarity, as it were, between the sexes even outside the reproductive season. And that's very easy to understand. I mean, you're dealing with the same species. Um, you can't kill, you know, members of the same species with impunity if you're to survive as a species. And so it's, I guess, I guess what's remarkable about felids is, is more their lack of chivalry than their, their, than, their, than their chivalry, but there is some chivalry there. And there's some mm. natural inhibition whereby the male doesn't want to harm his own species. But there's also, it is also puzzling that the female didn't just disappear, didn't just slink off. She stayed around long enough to, you know, basically have a kind of a, a what in human terms we can call a dance with the male. Um, it, it, looks, it looks rather ferocious for a dance, but we are dealing with a carnivore. And, and I think you're right in, mm. that, in that even though she's greatly outpowered by him he does sustain a you know he does experience a risk of of damage to his eyesight if he gets in and and starts trading claw strokes and so they are a bit circumspect around each other um but it looked like some kind of a ritual in which maybe she's hanging around because she knows that if she appeases him he she will be able to go in and have more food after he's had his fill because at some point, imagine he comes back, he's going to get hungry in a few hours, even if he ate previously. He's going to eat most of the sambar deer carcass. And then he's going to kind of lose interest. You know, he'll, if he had his druthers, he'll come back later and eat it all. But he's kind of sated for now. And so the next time the female goes and tries to polish off the leftovers, he's not going to be so motivated to stop her because he's eaten his filth. And he might resent it, but not enough to you know, do something about it. And so she knows that if she can just, mm. you know, basically um, appease him uh, and acknowledge his superiority, as it were, then, you know, uh, stick around because there's enough chivalry there that she, she can get some food. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, would have been, it's a pity we can't see the, uh, the final outcome there. At, at we, the end we of the video... Yeah, we are talking about a prey animal, a prey individual of about you know 250 kilograms in that sambar deer. It's a big deer. It's one of the biggest deer. 
and, yeah. uh, and that that deer, even though it wasn't fully mature, is as big as the male um, uh, tiger. So he's not going to eat all of it in a hurry. There's still going to mm. be a fair bit left after he's sated himself. I was a bit surprised that the tiger didn't just settle down to eat the deer in the road. It's uh, you know at, at the end of the scene, it, it slinks away into the into the bush. Um, did you also have that surprise or not? Yes, I, I, I do. I do. I am surprised by that, and I can't really comment. I didn't really see a distended belly in the male. I don't know. It, it doesn't seem to me like he was particularly full. Maybe mm. it was just hot. Maybe it's just hot. You know, I don't think tigers do very well in the heat. We know that tigers yeah. in, in, in the Bengal tiger in India often does something the lion does not do, which is to go and find a pool to lie in. Oh, right. Okay. Um, and so, you know, maybe it was just heat stressed. And because it's the top of the food pyramid in that particular location, it doesn't really have to worry about any other species stealing its prey. Yeah. There's no, there's no, nothing like a spotted hyena there, you know. So mm. it can just relax a bit, sh cool off in the shade, and then come back when it's when it's ready. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Great. Thanks for those insights. Any any parting thoughts? No. Um, Listeners, we'll be um, we'll be on this on the lookout for more um, fascinating video clips of this sort. Um, there should be more from India because one of the advantages of India is that there's a small army of enthusiastic Indian, as opposed to tourist um, photographers. You know, India has mm. a wonderful wonderful presence of Indian uh, citizens who are well equipped with photographic and video gear and who enthusiastically tour their limited repertoire of rather small but fascinating national parks and, and wildlife areas. And so we'll probably get more interesting footage from India over the, over the, 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 over the course of time. And so look forward to more commentaries um, of this sort in future. Great. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thanks. We'll see you later. Bye. Cheers.